Dr. Kaiser, Jay, what, what's the worst thing you ever heard about somebody going through neurofeedback, like the experience that they have? Just from the, from just doing this podcast, I, I heard there's a possibility of a seizure. The thing that I've heard most of is that sometimes you, a client will have a, a memory from the past and it'll become emotional and you have to deal with it. Uh, and a headache. Those are the three things that I've heard from doing the show. Is, is there anything else that could possibly happen? Well, first of all, it, it, you're not going to cause a seizure in somebody who doesn't have an underlying uh, disorder in the first place. Yeah, creating a seizure is not easy to do, or there'd be a whole bunch of them happening in the neurofeedback world. This, this, is, not, this is not a side effect of the, of the training. If somebody has a seizure disorder and they have intermittent seizures, they may have one after a session or between sessions, but they, they were having them before. So they can have one in a therapy session. Yeah. And uh, they, they could have had it during having their toenails done. I mean, this, this, is, this is not a side effect of the neurofeedback. Doing the wrong thing can cause a problem. There was a study back when it was still ethically possible. IRBs, institutional review boards, won't allow this now. It's called an ABA design, where you do the thing you think is going to make the person better, then you switch the protocol to do it exactly the opposite, which would make mm. them worse, which is why they don't let you do this anymore, and then switch it back to do it the way that was going to make yeah. them better. Now, yeah. that was actually done with epilepsy patients, with Joe Lubar's uh, work with Barry Sturman. And the seizure rate went down. They switched the protocol unbeknownst to the client. The, all they got is, is, is like a, 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 a red light or something as a feedback. And uh, they, they switched the protocol. Actually, they got worse. They switched the protocol back to the SMR. Uh, training was slow and fast inhibition. And they got better again. Yeah. Obviously, they didn't stop on the getting them worse form of, of the training. But it's a very powerful demonstration of the power of the technique but again the, you can't do that now and I, I don't blame the irb for not allowing it because you know anything that you do that deliberately will make something worse isn't a good idea uh, it's a powerful demonstration but it's not a good idea uh, the side effect of uh, having a headache after a session uh, is is not uncommon uh, but uh, is quite often uh, not directly related to the neurofeedback, but rather uh, uh, somebody tilting their head forward and staring at a screen and getting a headache at the back of the head from the body position. I mean, there, there are side effects that are unrelated. There's still a side effect after the session, but they're not related to the neurofeedback. Well, I have 50 years of experience and I have yet to see somebody have a side effect that wasn't able to be reversed very quickly with the with a, 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 a switch in the training intervention if you're training and you've trained to an end point and you keep going you can end up reversing and going back to the end point where you need to stop um it, it, it's you know the training protocol can be adjusted to account for the for the side effect uh, uh most of the quote side effects are transitory and the reversible, this isn't, you know, we don't end up with broken legs. We don't end up with uh, um, infections and uh, the, the kinds of side effects you can have from other medical procedures aren't the kind of side effects you have in your feedback. Our side effects are inconsequential, basically. Uh, unless a therapist has the inappropriate, no pain, no gain approach where you, I don't care what side effect you just had. We're doing this protocol, you know, down the torpedoes full speed ahead. Now, there, there are people that just don't stop and readjust and reorient, uh, but that, that's, that's not a technique problem. That's a, the therapist not being experienced enough or sensitive enough. Hi, I am Dr. Henry M. Kaiser, and you are listening to the Neuro Noodle Podcast. Welcome to Neuro Noodles, Neurofeedback and Neuropsychology podcast featuring tech legend Jay Gunkelman, who has performed at least a half a million brain scans. Our goal is to provide information and promote options for better mental health. My name is Pete, and today we have a very special guest, Dr. Henry Kaiser. 
But before we get to Dr. Kaiser, we have some Patreon love to give out. We are supported by listeners and businesses just like you, like our gold supporter, Applied Neuroscience Incorporated, the creators of NeuroGuide, the premier EEG assessment and training software whose demo version can be downloaded from the link here. Hey, check it out. Applied Neuroscience is having a workshop September 10th and 11th in Florida, Madura Beach, Florida. Hey, two ways you can participate. You can attend the workshop or you can do it remotely through TeamViewer or click on the link here, appliedneuroscience.com slash attend-ng-workshops. Hey, check it out. Dr. Thatcher is inviting everybody that attends to his house for a cookout. Sign up now. It's going to be a blast. Woohoo! If you have any questions, email QEEG at AppliedNeuroscience.com. Join us. Hey, thanks to our silver supporters, Mary Tracy's awesome QEEG training program at EEGStrategies.com and My Media's Nexus EEG Amplifier. Welcome aboard, Erwin. They're at MindMedia.com. Dr. Kaiser, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Well, it's a privilege to be here, and my friend Josh, I think, introduced you, uh, me to you, or yes, so yeah. that's what leads to that. Always a thank you to the people who get you involved in the networking on this whole yeah. subject of neurofeedback. Yeah, jo Joshua Moore, he's an alternative behavioral health out, out in uh, Vancouver, Washington, which is, might as well be Portland, Oregon, right? He said yep. we had to get you on the show. I reached out, and you graciously came on. Dr. Kaiser, could you please inform our new listeners, new viewers about your background? Well, I went to Lawrence College in Appleton, Wisconsin, then the Stanford Business School, and then uh, the U.S. Navy, in the Vietnam area, Supply Corps. And then I was with Kaiser Industries for uh, five years uh, before it went into voluntary liquidation. And in that time, I did both corporate stuff and healthcare stuff. And all of it involved innovation. And how do you implement? It? And uh, it was domestic and it was international. When the time came to leave Kaiser, one thing that didn't change is I didn't go off the board of the Kaiser Hospitals and Health Plan. I stayed on that board for 30 years. And I was usually involved in uh, facilities committees and finance and audit stuff. And then uh, I was also on the Kaiser Family Foundation Board. It's a non-beneficial trust for 20 years, uh, which has now become sort of a health policy think tank. All of those experiences uh, gave me a pretty good sense of gestalt about the healthcare field from a very high level, not research, not medical, not devices, anything else. Where all that happened was I somehow found my way kicking and screaming and protesting into the entrepreneurial world. And that led me to the venture capital. And that led me into the whole business of starting companies, advising companies, occasionally running something, although I'm not sure that was ever my strong suit, but sometimes that's what you have to do. Led me to uh, uh, Grace Stratton and neurofeedback. And what I could do this morning, if you like, is uh, tell your audience about the Neurofeedback Advocacy Project. The significance here is you'll see that what we have, as opposed to research studies about neurofeedback, there's lots of studies, but it's never the way somebody wants, or if it's not the right number of people, or it's not the right experimental design, or it's this, or it's that, or it's the other thing. And it's one point in time. The Neurofeedback Advocacy Project is now a continuously accumulating stream of data of efficacy and outcomes. And that's new. And if we're ever going to get neurofeedback into uh, mainstream medicine, it's going to take something like that to get it done. We are in the business of, if you go to this site, you will find out about us, who are our participating sites. And what do I mean by that? We have all of these agencies around the country, starting from really one 
in 2018 that Matt knew in NeuroG at Matt Fleischman. What these people are doing is saying that they are working with our program to train their people and to get the specialized uh, Othmer uh, equipment to deliver neurofeedback into agencies that are serving Medicaid-eligible people of all ages. And what some of these counties have been able to do, like Clackamas or Lane, somewhere in here, is when they give a uh, session to a, uh, a Medicaid-eligible, usually very high ACE score person, they then submit uh, to their coordinated care organization uh, a claim for reimbursement using the standard psychotherapy codes. In some counties, uh, those uh, CCOs are able to say, okay, we're not going to tell you how to practice th psychotherapy. The neurofeedback is just a tool. So we will reimburse you at the standard psychotherapy rate. Now, in its great wisdom, uh, the uh, organ uh, the health department authority either is or isn't aware of that. But in Washington and Multnomah counties, they are not giving permission to do that. As far as I can tell, an inconsistent approach without through the state. And I, I really don't know why I've gone to them to say, it's just not good to have a, a something like this be inconsistent throughout the state. Uh, the organized healthcare system organized medicine ought to be taking a better look at what neurofeedback is. And why is that? And for that, I want to take you to the results page that shows you what we're doing. The results tracking system is something that Dr. Matt Fleischman has developed. And when I say developed, it's it's a it's an integration of his, you know, really profound knowledge of uh, therapy and uh, therapeutic sessions over his 30-year career, including his development and experience with a number of different neurofeedback systems. And he has felt that the system he wants to work with is the Othmer system, although the results tracking system could actually work with any system. But anyway, he's developed this system that is, and he's combined it with his ability with software and Google Sheets and all that uh, kind of technology, and he has built uh, the system, which is reporting the results I'm going to show you here. We have an ability to say we have, after 10 sessions, our clients show at least a 10 uh, at least a 24 percent reduction in the severity of their concerns. And I'm going to show you my personal use of the results tracking system. Since it's mine, uh, there are no HIPAA violations going on here. Okay, no privacy concerns. Every time a client comes in to any one of these participating agencies, we sit down with the uh, client and we go through a very extensive intake situation and we review what are the areas of concern? And it, given the areas of concern, what are the probable sites we ought to be at? We look at uh, kinds of things that would be indications of what would be uh, important to study. We give guidance as to what some of these measures are, and we click the box so we know, is this person a two or three or four or five, we don't ask them embarrassing questions, we just ask them for a number. So we're getting a fairly good intake uh, piece of data about what the situation is. And so if we look at our sessions, what we're doing is during the intake, we are asking anybody that we're working with to give five or eight sessions of what's going on, what's concerning them and what's it like on a bad week, a good week, or a usual week. So we have a baseline. And then as we go through the various sessions, we say uh, we give uh, a session of neurofeedback and we ask, uh, how are you today? And we get an update. 
and every date, every time we're doing that, what we did, at which site, and at which frequency. And so if something happened that is different, we say, okay, uh, on this date, we added that site. And therefore, after one eighth, what happened uh, necessarily, let's go uh, uh, on the eighth, we see what happened. Did, did we get any kind of an unusual result? And by this means, we build an ability to take all of this data and integrate it into this chart. This is a HIPAA compliant research platform so that anybody wants to get down in the weeds and how it works and what it does, that would be a future project for discussion with Matt Fleischman. But what we also have done is to say, what are some other indications of what happens with now, uh, we have about almost 600 active uh, clients, individual records. And uh, some of these cases are completed. So we have over a thousand records now. So we've got a statistically significant database whereby we say self-harm suicidal ideation goes down. Discipline actions at school do go down. Drugs and alcohol relaxes go down. Nicotine use, not so much. Uh, then we can look at other issues. ER visits for medical reasons, they go down. For psychiatric reasons, they go down. Hospitalizations go down. When you take all of this information, what you're finding out is that we are showing absolutely for certain that this kind of a medical intervention in mental health is having a tremendous impact, not only on the quality of the service being received, but on the costs of a major healthcare system. We're taking huge costs out of the system. How do we know that? Well, let's go over here to uh, uh, cost impact on agency revenue. We've developed calculators. This calculator happens to be concerned with no-show rates. Most no-show rates for agencies serving Medicaid el el eligible clients have a no-show rate of around 35%, maybe 30, maybe 40. Our no-show rate is 4% or less. Why is that? Because the clients don't have to do anything special. They don't get asked embarrassing questions. They sit in a chair and they watch Netflix or YouTube. And what's not to like about that? And we don't ask them embarrassing questions. And not only that, but they come back the next day or the next day, two weeks later, and they say, I feel better. So our participation is uh, really uh, rather spectacular. Now we can also go and say, what's what is the impact of a reduction in these various issues if you somehow had lower hospitalization admittance rates? We again have a calculator. We can show there are rather specific uh, savings to be achieved in the system. All of this is designed to be a way to say to people, is it placebo? Are there enough studies? Well, let's let somebody else deal with that. All we're saying is this is what is happening at a very large number of sites and a very large number of people. Now, about us, who we are, participating sites, let's see, about neurofeedback. We know who we're dealing with. Okay, we can define the population by all of these metrics. And then you can cut and slice and dice it any way you want. And we can do this. This is for everybody in the system, which is about 20 groups now. And we can also do it for each individual agency. So they can see, any agency can see their own data and how they compare to the rest of the site. All this data, so what? Well, what we have been trying to do all along is to say, good, we want to add more agencies and all this, but are we making progress in getting this into established medicine? Uh, I have introduced this 
to the head of behavioral health at Kaiser, uh, Dr. Don Mordecai. And he gave it some time. He gave it some study. But what did he conclude? There's not enough research. So he looked at this data, and he said, there's not enough research. And, and uh, I actually went to the chairman and said, well, that's fine, and, and copied Don in. And I said, well, if you were going to uh, see these kinds of savings, why would you not just do a pilot? Pick one site. Get your own experience. And it, I, I quickly, we got a very friendly feedback from uh, uh, the right people at Kaiser saying, well, you know, maybe talking to the chairman isn't the right thing to do. And I said, yes, I cried uncle and went along with that. So I, I'm not, I'm not trying to start a war or criticize people or anything else. What I'm saying is I keep trying to find ways to help move the needle on getting neurofeedback broader exposure. Now, next thing I tried is Senator Wyden last fall put out a, a request for information. He's very interested in child welfare. So he put out a solicitation for ideas uh, about what how to help improve child welfare systems and the treatment they get. So I sent in uh, a little piece about neurofeedback, and I thought he might be interested in it, and I introduced this, this program of ours, which, by the way, is now... 501c3. Uh, Matt invited me to be, as I said, a co-director of it, and so we we worked together on it. Uh, neither of us took any compensation. We're not we're not doing anything except making it possible for the agencies to get the training they need online now, very inexpensively, and also to be able to get the uh, the equipment needed, the twelve thousand five hundred dollar piece of equipment for about 400 bucks a month. So what that meant is we've lowered the cost for these agencies, which because of their no-show rate and other reasons, they're getting about an eight to one positive financial benefit from uh, using your own feedback. But at any rate, so I reported all that to uh, in responding to Senator Wyden. And I think Senator Merkley was interested in it too. Anyway, and so I get a call uh, from what from a consultant, uh, Susan Brunberg, who's interested in the uh, child welfare system. And and I interview her, and she t asks about the program, and I finally say, yeah, you got to talk to Matt Fleischman. This is really interesting. So she does. And then she introduces Matt to another session uh, with about 70 people listening, and that begins to expand our number of participating groups. Uh, Susan brings in another person, a uh, 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 Marine Flatley, and they make a proposal to us and say, gee, we think you ought to have broader broader exposure. And uh, we think you we could help you reorganize your board. And we think you could, maybe there's some legislation you ought to be part of. Anyway, we're going to make you part of the big time. But we'd like to be a consultant to you on this. And so Matt and I, uh, we raised some money. And we did get them involved and they are now engaged in a project which could move the neurofeedback advocacy project out of what I very inaccurately call loving hands at home to now something which might have some national impact. And that's where we are. Where that will go from here, uh, my own personal involvement here is a little less. I've stepped back. I, I'm no longer on the or, or a co-director. So I continue to talk with Matt from time to time about what's going on, but I'm not as involved as I formerly was. Dr. Kaiser, and, who is Matt Fleischman? Could you, could you give me so a So Matt Fleischman is a, a therapist in uh, based in Eugene, Oregon, and he's also an experienced NIH researcher. So he, he is, you know, a very well-qualified person who understands experimental design. He's he's been interested in neurofeedback for, for decades. He's watched the progress of every uh, system that's gone along. And he, he settled in on the Othman method or where he wanted to focus. And uh, one of the things that came out of some work that Matt did was uh, he was invited to be a presenter this last May at Boston conference put on by uh, Bessel van der Kolk's group. Bessel van der Kolk, yeah. So Matt gets up and presents this kind of data. And when he gets 
uh, into that uh, first slide, I guess, of reduction in symptoms, the audience gasps. Who's in the audience? Providers. So that's great. But they're not policy makers. But it's a start. The broader the broader exposure we get, uh, I, and I, even though I'm not involved, I keep saying we, force a habit. The, the more the exposure, the more people begin to take a look at it. And the more people begin to say, well, how can I work with my local state agencies or my local health authority? And what really happens is you've got something here. There isn't a recorded incident, I think, on the whole history of this field of anybody being injured or hurt or anything but help. There's no safety issues. There's no problem like that. And people who want to give better service to their uh, clients, uh, find a way, join the program, get trained in this, get access to the equipment. And when they do, the one thing that we ask of them is use the results tracking system. If you're not using the results tracking system, we're going to know it. But if you will use the results tracking system, then we can keep building our database. But we also want people to participate in the case, in the case discussions and the various seminars we give. So it is a continu continuing education program so people get better and better and better and better at the whole skill level involved in uh, the author method. What, uh, what frequencies are you going to monitor? Uh, what are your site placements? What problems are you having with your clients? All of that kind of thing. Dr. Kaiser, so, how much research do you need? I keep hearing we need more research. What is the magic number? Since you have the last name Kaiser, I would think you'd be able to answer that. <laughs> no, nobody has an answer for that. Not even Dr. Kaiser? <laughs> well, you need enough research so that people stop saying we need more research. And I don't know <laughs> what that tipping point is. And I can't get anybody to tell me. And I'm not sure they know. Jay, and, what, Jay what do you think? Well, uh, you need more research is really uh, quite often just a, a way to dismiss the uh, topic. I'll believe it when I see it is really, I'll see it when I believe it. So uh, it, it'd be really good if they could give you, oh, you have an N of 1,000 and an N of 10,000. Um, and then you'd have a distinct end goal. But if you had 10,000, they might want 100,000. So uh, the, getting an answer from them would be beneficial, but I don't know that they could give you one. Uh, uh, again, they don't have the belief in the technique at all. Harms their ability to accept the results. Uh, they'll see it when they believe it. That old adage is just all too true. Uh, having them have direct experience with it might change their uh, idea about it. I mean, your direct experience of your uh, training and outcomes uh, undoubtedly influenced uh, your level of belief in the technique. If it had been a waste of your time and energy, you would have gone on to something else. Uh, but it's, it's hard to end up uh, suggesting that they need, uh, well, you need the therapy, <laughs> you know, uh, you don't believe this? Well, you need therapy. Uh, well, that's that's hardly an answer that people are going to accept either. It, it's just a very difficult quandary. Uh, data will help. I, I think at some point, uh, getting the right people that have the right experience will also end up being key to making this click. I've seen, uh, well, first of all, the ACEs that you're dealing with, uh, some people might think, oh, ACE, that's like somebody doing something really well. And, but it's adverse childhood experiences. And the ACEs uh, simple questionnaire uh, 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 taken early in life can predict late life outcomes. And you know, high blood pressure, cardiac problems, uh, uh, severe health consequence later in life can be predicted based on these early life negative experience, adverse experiences. And if you treat the person appropriately, as you show, you can save millions of dollars later by doing treatment early and avoiding the 
expensive end of life care uh, expenses that end up eating up most of the healthcare dollars. So, Jay, are you? We are supported by listeners and businesses just like you, like our gold supporter, Applied Neuroscience Incorporated, the creators of NeuroGuide, the premier EEG assessment and training software whose demo version can be downloaded from the link here. Hey, check it out. Applied Neuroscience is having a workshop September 10th and 11th in Florida, Madura Beach, Florida. Hey, two ways you can participate. You can attend the workshop or you can do it remotely through TeamViewer or click on the link here, appliedneuroscience.com slash attend-ng-workshops. Hey, check it out. Dr. Thatcher is inviting everybody that attends to his house for a cookout. Sign up now. It's going to be a blast. Woohoo! If you have any questions, email QEEG at AppliedNeuroscience.com. Join us. You are uh, familiar with Judy Carlson's work at the VA in Hawaii? No, I'm not familiar with her, no. Well, the audience should know that now they've gone on to a larger study, but there was an, an initial study of just four. It was, a, if you will, a pilot study. Four 100% disability uh, clients. 100% disability. They couldn't hold a job, couldn't rent an apartment, completely dysfunctional. They, after 10 sessions of Offmer Method neurofeedback, these clients were rated as 100% functional. They could get jobs. Okay. They could be independent living. They could take care of their basic needs. They were able to form relationships. There are places, people working at what we would regard as the real frontier of this. And when you get things like the VA involved, when you when these two consultants of ours, uh, if they're successful in getting federal level le legislation involved, federal level policymakers involved, that changes the game. Because if if it's easy enough to be dismissive of now a growing number of people and agencies doing this work, it gets a little harder when you get into high-level politics. All of a sudden, those people have clout. And that begins to move the needle. Not that anybody thinks that's the better way to go or the only way to go, but sometimes that's the only thing that works. And uh, so I like what the neurofeedback advocacy is trying to do. But as is often the case with things that are in process and underway, some activities are underway, which we, sh we probably shouldn't talk about yet. And I hate doing business that way, but that's the world we live in. And you have to work sort of under the radar and find the right people under the right circumstances who don't have some other conflicting agenda and find out that Above all, looking into this isn't causing them any risk. The real of the challenges here, people are afraid of risking, not so much doing anything unethical or doing anything unprofessional, but when you, sometimes all this data leads to people uh, facing an inconvenient truth. What do I do with this? How do we get around that? And that Jay, is, we're discovering. We have 100 years of experience in this room. You two take up the majority of it. So what is the government worried about? What are people, what's the risk? What's the downside? Well, I think because of the activities now going on uh, in the neurofeedback since we hired those two consultants, we may get an answer to that. It generally starts with what is the problem somebody with, you know, influence, power, want to solve? In this case, it appears to be uh, the issue of child welfare and all the subcategories of that. If, if somebody in a elected office or in a high position uh, in a health agency says, 
I have the authority, and I want to shine a bright light on this. Then it happens. And what entrepreneurs do, like me, is we 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 hunt around until we find that. Uh, or as Matt Fleischman did, he recruited most of our agencies. And how did he do that? Because he's been in the field so long that he knows a lot of people, and they know him. And so they say, hmm, that sounds credible. I think I'll try it. Besides, I can afford it. And besides, I now see the data. I'd like some of that. Does does Elon and, Musk need data for a sewing machine? I uh, have not talked to Elon Musk about that. Uh, I, as a matter of fact, I haven't even gotten an appointment. But to me, to me, the uh, the simple thing is really at a space level. It's reaching out. It's networking. That's how a movement starts, and and you eventually move from uh, enthusiasm to data to reproducibility to is the platform HIPAA compliant? Is it a true research database tool? Can it be used? I mean, could you could you go to uh, use eager on this, let's say, and do C6, C7 uh, for uh, bipolar work, as an example? We haven't done it. Could be done. There are other ways of, of looking at this. So uh, it's it's people and what their interests are and can you get their time? And in a world where we're dealing with abortion and gun control and Ukraine and everything else going on, it's easy to say, yeah, well, maybe this is a tempest in a teapot and not a priority. I'm sorry. Walk around any town and look at the homeless. I'm not saying that they're high A score people, but they may well be. And yes, they need housing. And yes, they need food. And yes, they need legal help. But they are also people who have experienced high trauma. And their brains are not working optimally, probably. And so why wouldn't we say, in addition to feeding them and housing them, let's do what Judy Carlson did with her people in Hawaii. Let's help them reduce the issues that are causing their their mental functioning to be less less than optimal. When we can do it. And we can do it inexpensively. And we have the technology and the people. The, the other issue that is a, is a bottleneck right now is training, not only enough providers, but we need more trainers. Here in the U.S. for uh, Othmer Method, we have maybe 10 trainers now. In Europe, there are 60 trainers. They're all over the place. Yeah. In some countries, Neurofeedback is an approved reimbursable uh, uh, model. Much I, I do think that that's going to end up leveraging things here in the U.S. as well. The competitive other countries are doing us and having success and we're not. Uh, I, I think that's going to leverage things as well. Uh, oh, so yeah. There, there's international societies in Europe, the Society for Applied Neuroscience. There's a, a, a Swiss society. There's a... Yep. Spanish society, there's a new Italian society, obviously Australasian, uh, the Koreans. I mean, yeah. the, internationally, there's a tremendous amount of growth and interest. And I do think that that's starting to have a, a, a peaking of the interest in the United States because, again, we do have that competitive sort of a, an edge to ourselves. And if we see other it, people have is that, is that a nice word? Is that a nice word for provincialism? <laughs> Well, provincialism is probably a nice word for something else as well. So, <laughs> uh, never mind. We won't go there. Uh, but yeah, and we are starting to get inquiries internationally for yeah. participating in the neurofeedback advocacy project. Yeah, it is happening. Yep. How do we get? Uh, all, if we need more research, how do we get everybody in the U.S. to kind of share their da data? Because everybody wants to operate in their silo and have their own profit center, but in order for this thing to grow even larger, we have to share the information. Do you think that day will come where there's one database instead of several? Yeah, well, they don't necessarily need to have only one database. There's lots and lots of approaches. 
you know, the Offmer method is a fabulous method, but there are other methods as well for other specific applications. And the, the ability to integrate in other approaches into this overall method to provide data and, and outcomes is, I think, the right approach. Um, it's, it's always been difficult to end up having people agree to where's the repository for all this information. But we've got one now that has an N of 1,000 and growing. And um, I, I think uh, people that are watching are going to have to look at the detail that comes along with the podcast where they have websites and contact information. And uh, we, we have uh, Dr. Kaiser's uh, website that they can uh, go to and affiliate with and sign up on. Um, I would hope that uh, we have a little bump in your um, uh, number of uh, sites that are interested in, in affiliating. Uh, I, I hope that this ends up helping some. I, I think that the international uh, community also needs to be uh, brought in uh, to, to the same method uh, so that our our uh, N grows exponentially. Uh, the N of 10,000 may be the number that ends up turning ahead in Washington. Uh, it might be 100,000. But if we get more centers involved, those numbers come fast with the multi-center approach. So um, I, I hope we uh, bump up the number of uh, people that end up uh, going to the website and uh, signing up and, and uh, Dr. Yeah. Kaiser, we have several hundred people that watch this every week. How can we help you? Where do we send them to? Well, first of all, let me say that uh, I'm not sure that I would be noticed anymore on my on the neurofeedback advocacy project. Uh, the way to reach me in my mental health interests, because I have other things I'm doing, is through probably through uh, uh, go to www.brightminds training.com that is my effort to my desired target population is seniors because i'm 78 now most seniors are not on medicaid <laughs> so so it's a private pay market but but that's okay but if you reach me on that site and want to know more that's that's the way to do it uh dr henry m kaiser at gmail.com or if you want to go into my regular mailbox along with you know, cleaning escalator handrails and <laughs> other things I'm doing, uh, just henrymkaisergmail.com. But I remain interested in this field, and it will be helpful to introduce people to Matt Fleischman, who basically what, what could really help is more agencies signing up and joining the Neurofeedback Advocacy Project. We've never gone out and solicited for money. We are a 501c3. We have received uh, uh, some donations, but it's been modest. Uh, but right now, we're functioning properly. We have, we have financial management. We have legal advice. We have software consultants. Uh, and, and we have a good uh, uh, social optimization, social marketing capabilities. So you'll look for us on Facebook and all the other kinds of things that people look to. Do Dr. He Dr. Henry Kaiser, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Pleasure to be here. Thank you all for watching Neuro Noodles, Neurofeedback, and Neuropsychology Podcast. We'd like to thank our Patreon business supporters. We are supported by listeners and businesses just like you, like our gold supporter, Applied Neuroscience Incorporated, the creators of NeuroGuide, the premier EEG assessment and training software whose demo version can be downloaded from the link here. Hey, check it out. Applied Neuroscience is having a workshop September 10th and 11th in Florida, Madura Beach, Florida. Hey, two ways you can participate. You can attend the workshop or you can do it remotely through TeamViewer or click on the link here, appliedneuroscience.com slash attend-ng-workshops. Hey, check it out. Dr. Thatcher is inviting everybody that attends to his house for a cookout. Sign up now. It's going to be a blast. Woohoo! If you have any questions, email QEEG at AppliedNeuroscience.com. Join us. Hey, thanks to our silver supporters, Mary Tracy's awesome QEEG training program at EEGstrategies.com and my Media's Nexus EEG Amplifier. Welcome aboard, Erwin. They're at MindMedia.com. 
Three things our listeners can do to help us spread the word of neurofeedback. Number one, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Number two, give us a review on whatever platform you listen to. Five stars is appreciated, but Jay Gunkelman will accept four and a half. Hey, if you have the means, please support us on Patreon slash Neuronoodle. There are different levels in which you can support us, whether you're a mom or dad or a clinician. There's even an option where you can have your own Q&A with our own Jay Gunkelman. This support help, helps us improve the quality of our content. Hey, trying to get these video edits even better, even better. Again, we thank you all for watching. Cue the non-copyrighted music.